All right, everybody, let's get started. Um, like I said, I did my absolute very best to get your exam graded between now and uh, or between uh, uh, when you took it today. It just didn't happen, and I'd rather take my time to make sure I do it right. So <clears throat> I can tell you that I definitely want to get it graded by Wednesday because we have an exam in concrete design. So maybe what I'll do is this. We'll have the exam in concrete design, and since most of you who are in concrete design and steel design, I'll let you tell me if you want me to give you the grade on the steel exam right after you took the concrete exam, or maybe we wait until Friday. I'll let you decide. <laughs> You're like, oh, God, that exam was horrible. Hey, would you like a grade on the steel exam? No, give, give me a little. <laughs> give me a little bit. So, so we'll see. Um, I went ahead and assigned your bolted connection homework. There's three problems. Um, you can definitely do the first one today. Um, other than the layout requirements, but that's a really, really quick check. There is sort of one caveat to that problem because it's a splice um, that I'll kind of explain today. It's not hard, it's just something you got to think about. Um, there's, like I said, there's three problems. I'd say after today, you could definitely do the first one and probably do the second one. The third one is not hard, but we're not going to get to that today. Um, <coughs> what I want to do is focus primarily on finishing the example we did last time and really get a decent chunk into bolted connection design. Okay? So I actually want to focus a bit on what I've got written on the board. Um, now let me go back to some slides that we focused on for the past little bit. Um, I know with bolted connections, I kind of say a lot of the same stuff over and over again, but uh, it's kind of important just to make sure that we, we all have sort of a, um, uh, 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 we're on the same page. Okay, so remember, ultimately what we're after in bolted connections is to look at two different types of connections. That's bearing type connections and slip critical connections. Now, we haven't talked about slip critical connections. That's probably going to be the latter part of today's lecture. Maybe a little bit into Wednesday. I don't know. Uh, but that's coming later. Okay? Now, with bearing type connections, you have two limit states that you need to assess. You need to assess the capacity of the bolt. In other words, how much force is required to shear the bolts. And then also the capacity of the plate. The, the plate failing in a bearing type failure. So for the shear capacity, it's just it's, it's a pretty simple calc, although we never really need to calculate it, because remember there are only two variables that we need to assess when we're looking at the capacity of a uh, bolt in shear, you know, other than its diameter and what material it's made out of, and that is our threads in the shear plane, uh, which is simple, you know, just an observation. If you didn't know, what do you assume? That they're included. That's the worst case scenario. It's possible you don't know, okay? So, if you don't know, assume they're included. So, we have uh, one variable is whether or not the threads are included in the shear plane, uh, and that's handled by just using different FNV values, and then how many shear planes, in fact, there are. Now, again, all of this is, is rote, or it doesn't really matter, because our guide on table 7-1 does all of this for us, right? We just, so for bolt shear capacity, we can just go to table 7-1 and boom. It lists the shear capacity on a per bolt basis. We just look at our connections, see how many bolts there are, and there you go. So pretty simple. Remember, we look at the blue numbers, not the green numbers. Bolt bearing, remember we have two different types of failure that can happen. And, and uh, remember, this is the bolt literally bearing on the plate. Okay. So one is that the, uh, the plate can tear out, uh, sort of like a mini block shear failure. Bleh, mini block shear failure. A little bit tongue twisted. Uh, and the other is bolt hole ovalization. In other words, the plate bearing on, on the, or the, the bolt bearing on the plate and it's sort of mashing up and plastifying uh, near, the, uh, near the bolt hole. Our expression is pretty straightforward. Remember, we split that up into our minimum expression, you know, minimum of the uh, 1.2 LCTFU or 2.4 DBTFU. Uh, this is for the tear out, this is for the ovalization. Uh, and we've gone through really the, the parameter, the tough part is the LC, which it's really not tough because we can derive formulas that plug and chug this out. Uh, the only thing to keep in mind is the, uh, let me skip ahead, the only thing to keep in mind is A, we can rewrite the expression a little bit 
and b that our hull diameter is the bolt diameter plus a sixteenth of an inch this time, not an eighth. Okay. So <coughs> um, the last thing that we, we need to assess is the spacing and, and edge distance requirements. We actually didn't do that on example eight, so I want to finish that real quick on example eight today, uh, and then we will get into our design example. But remember, we have a minimum spacing of two and two thirds times the bolt diameter, or eight thirds. It's not two plus two thirds. That's a you know was it mixed fraction, right? Whatever when fourth grade, so it's two and two thirds. So eight thirds. Uh, eight thirds is the minimum spacing. Uh, preferred spacing is three times the bolt diameter. I actually tend to go off the minimum when I'm using three quarter inch bolts, uh, but again because that comes out to be two inches. But again for um, uh, for, for bolted connections, a three inch grid pattern is very, very common for bolted connection layouts. Minimum edge distance. Minimum edge distance you look up. Um, maximum uh, edge distance and bolt spacings come from the spec. Now, we have the same maximum spacing requirement for whatever connection we're looking at. The edge distance requirement, though, there's actually two of them. One's for painted steel and one's for unpainted steel. And I always use the unpainted one. It's a little bit more strict, and I know that if I meet this limit, I meet everything. So over here in my uh, uh, you know, summary slides, I've got you know, bolt shear capacity, bolt bearing capacity, and then I have my spacing requirements. I just said that this is the edge distance, or hold on, wait. Do I have that backwards? Let's see. Wait, 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 wait. I think I might have that backwards. Let me see. Maximum distance from bolt edge. No, no, no. I, I have that backwards up here. I'm sorry. This is backwards. Sorry. This is, yeah. Sorry about that. This, oh, sorry. And that's, uh, man. I caught it, though. So we're not adding that one to the mistake counter, especially because I brought my manual today. So we're not going to add that. I did pretty good today. I'm kidding. Okay, so we have our bolt shear capacity, we have our bolt bearing capacity, we have our bolt spacing and edge distance requirements. Again, sorry, so to clarify and to make sure it's clear, the edge distance requirement doesn't matter whether or not it's painted or weathering, it's the spacing requirement that depends on whether or not it's painted or weathering, or painted or unpainted, and I'm going to assume unpainted, just the worst case scenario. Okay. Questions? Apologies for that little bit of confusion. Okay, now I want to point my attention up here to what I have here on the board. So I sort of took all this and simplified it, but I want to look at this little table. So we have two different types of connections that we're going to look at, bearing type connections and slip critical connections. So bearing type connections are what we've been looking at up until now, and they are required to meet the uh, limit states of bolt shear and bolt bearing. Later on, we're going to have slip critical connections. The only difference is we just have a, another check that we have to add, another slip check. Now, this is going to mean a lot from a, a capacity and design standpoint because it's probably going to mean we add more bolts, but that just wanted to make sure that, that, that you were aware of uh, that coming. Sound good? All right, now, here's the problem that we did last time. We were looking at this uh, bolted connection. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, this is essentially a splice connection uh, because I've got, you know, these, because of the way the connection's lined out and, and if that doesn't become clear, now, or if that's not clear now, that will be later. Um, what we looked at last time was, here's the connection, and so we said, okay, first thing we can do is bolt shear, that's really easy. So each bolt could hold up 80.1 kips in shear because it was a group A bolt, threads were excluded. It's a one inch diameter bolt and it's in double shear. So did the math and we found that it's 480.6 kips that are required to shear those bolts. Now remember with bolt bearing, there are always two cases with bolt bearing. There's the case of you know, the plates transferring load that way and the plates transferring load that way or the members, you know, so on and so forth. So we looked at the main plate first, so the load, the one transferring load to the right. Um, so its thickness is three quarters, it's using three inch bolt spacing, and then the edge distance for that one is this distance right here, which is two and a half inches. And once you've got that, everything else is pretty rogue. You compute your LCE, your LCI, your two uh, bolt diameters, you recognize that you've got uh, an edge uh, bolt bearing capacity, an interior bolt bearing capacity, there's two edge bolts, four interior bolts, 
do the math and you find that the bolt bearing capacity is 457.7 kip. So between bolt shear and bolt bearing, bolt bearing govern this connection. So the plate's going to fail before the bolt shear. Um, now that's for that case. Remember there's always the case for the plates transferring the load in the other direction. All it is is just those different seed values are different. Uh, maybe a different uh, uh, thickness, maybe a different edge distance. Spacing is probably, you know, I can't really see a, a connection where that would be different just because of the way that works. <coughs> but thickness and edge distance very well could be different. And so you just do all that math again and you find that the space or the capacity ends up being 558. So obviously this is governed by the main plate, not the splice plate. Sound good? The last thing we need to look at, though, is the layout requirements. Again, really simple. Now, our let's start off with bolt spacing. So our minimum bolt spacing is 2 and 2 thirds times the bolt diameter. This problem, uh, so that's 8 thirds times the bolt diameter for this problem was one inch. So that's just eight thirds or what, 2.67 inches. Okay, now, here comes the question. Okay, so our maximum bolt spacing, we're gonna use, assume, you know, uh, metal that's subject to corrosion. So minimum, 14 times the thickness or 7 inches. Now that, that begs the question, okay, we have two different thickness values, right? One of them was 3 quarters, the other was 1 inch, right? Case 1 had a, a, a thickness of 3 quarters, case 2 has a total thickness of 1 inch. Which one do we use? What's that? It matter, it? No, it matters. In fact, in fact, actually the answer is neither one of those. Well, that's about it's still So we have, so let, let's look at our connection, okay? Um, I have a half inch plate, a three quarter inch plate, and a half inch plate, okay? Now what we said is the thickness was three quarters this way and one inch this way. But that's not really the case. What's really going on is I have two half-inch plates going this way, okay? What we're checking here is a spacing requirement. Remember, what is this spacing requirement guarding against? It's guarding against corrosion, right? Right? Because I mean, remember, if the bolts get too far apart, you get water seeped in between the plates, right? So my advice whenever you check this layout requirement, use the absolute minimum thickness plate in the entire connection, okay? And so that's not three quarters of an inch and it's not one inch, it's half inch. The thinnest plate in this connection is the half inch plate. So check your, your, your layout requirements around that. Again, because of what it's guarding against. It's guarding against corrosion. So this is the minimum of 14 times a half inch or seven inches. Now, 14 times a half is 7, so that's 7 inches, so, so there you go. But the reason I mention that is if you had, like, what if these were instead of two half-inch plates, what if they were two quarter-inch plates? Well, then use the quarter-inch, don't use the half-inch, and it's actually going to change your answer. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, our minimum bolt spacing is 2.67 inches. Our maximum bolt spacing is 7 inches. What is our actual bolt spacing? It's preferred, which is three. No, well, no, no, no. I'm talking about on the connection. What is the actual bolt spacing that they're using? Three inches. So what can you tell me about using a bolt spacing of three inches? You're shaking your head yes. Why are you shaking your head yes? It's between the minimum and the maximum, right? Your bolt spacing has got to be between 2.67 and 7 inches, and it's three. That's good, right? Typically, obviously your bolt spacing has to be between those two. Typically you want it to be a little bit closer to that. You want to use as minimum of a bolt spacing as possible because that takes a connection that could be this big and makes it that big. That's less steel, less 
money you know, to the client. So you want a, a somewhat small voltage connection. So our S is 3 inches, so that's okay. And that's going to help us out from a design standpoint, because when we design a voltage connection, that's how we're going to design it, is we're going to design uh, based off of you know, this very issue. Right. Now we're going to have an LE min, LE max. Let's start off with LE max. That's the easy one. Bless you. That's the minimum of 12T or 6 inches. And again, use the absolute minimum, the, the thinnest plate in the entire connection. So that is minimum 12 times a half inch or 6 inches, but that's obviously going to be 6 inches. Now, when I say the absolute thinnest plate, I mean the thinnest plate that's got bolts going through it. So, for instance, if you had like an I-beam or like a W-shape and you had bolts going through the flanges, you wouldn't use the web thick because the web doesn't have any bolts going through it. You don't have any water seeping in. Bless you. Does that make sense? So just, just the, the plates where bolts are going through. Because again, you're trying to ask yourself, is water going to seep in between those plates? So use the thinnest plate in that connection region. Now LE min, we can't really compute that. We have to look that up. We have to go to table J3.4, which is not going to be in the main body of the spec. That's in the back in the, uh, the 16.1 section. Specifically, 16.1-132. Again, I just have a tab around that bolted connection section because there's a lot of stuff here that we end up referring to. So 16.1-132. <coughs> Remember, this is in Chapter J. Chapter J is the chapter on connections. So J2 is for welds, J3 is for bolts, and so obviously we're in J3, so J3.4, that's this table. Okay, minimum edge distance from center of standard hole to edge of connected part. Now what's our bolt diameter for this problem? One inch. So the minimum edge distance is one and a quarter. Okay, so this is one and a quarter, one and a quarter. And this is from table J3.4. There we go. Alright, so our edge distance has got to be between 1.25 inches and 6 inches, right? Now we've got two edge distances. What do we have? What are our two edge distances for this problem? Remember, there's always two cases. What? Two and two and a half. Two and two and a half, right? Because it's two and a half for the main plate, and for this plate, it's two inches, right? Now, if we're looking at the, you know, if you're trying to figure out, well, which value do you look at? Maybe you look at the one that has the thinnest plate, or maybe you just look at both of them and say, well, my edge distance is either two inches or two and a half inches. But either way, that's okay. Sound good? That's pretty simple. Yes, sir? What happened if the LE min was like two and two and a half, four inch? The, if this was two and a quarter? Yeah. And you had two and two and a half. Yeah. I would say this plate fails, and I'd add. But so so, okay. Let's let's talk about that. Okay. So let's say it was two and a quarter. What I would say is looking at this connection, this plate right here fails, like these plates, because that distance is two inches, right? So what I would do is tell the fabricator, add more plates. Make it a quarter inch longer, you know. In fact, what we're going to do here in a little bit is we're going to lay out our connection according to those minimum requirements so that that doesn't happen. That's, that's a design issue that will become clear very quickly. But if you're in analysis mode, tell the fabricator they screwed up. 
Honestly, because uh, they did. That's a good question. Any other questions? All right, so is everybody fine on taking a connection, computing its capacity, and checking to see if it meets the spacing and the layout requirements? All right, if you can do that, then you can do design. I mean, design is, is, is pretty simple. I, I, I don't even have like a really, really formal design procedure written out because there's, I mean, it's pretty simple. Okay? So what we do is we take a connection, we take the load on that connection, and we say, all right, here's the load on this connection. Let's determine the capacity of a single volt. And so we look at the shear capacity of a single volt, and we just divide to obtain the, norm or the number of volts. And then we say, okay, here's the spacing requirements, here's the edge distance requirements. Let's lay out that connection accordingly and then check the bolt bearing capacity. And if we don't have enough bolt bearing capacity, there's a couple ways that we can assess that and that will become clear momentarily. Um, my goodness, I'm a popular guy. That's the wrong class. All right, any questions? So now I have a, a connection in, notice how, the, um, notice how the diagram is very vague. There's not a lot of dimension, okay? Um, that's because we're in connection design mode, and so I really don't know anything about the, the connection. The only thing I know is that I have a plate lapped on top of another plate. That's it. And this connection is going to be designed to hold up a dead load of 115 kips and a live load of 160 kips. We'll assume that live load reduction has already been done. We're going to assume group B bolts. We're going to say the threads are excluded. Um, we have A572 grade 50 plate. Uh, the plate is 12 inches wide and 7 eighths inches thick. Now, one thing with this problem that I have done to make it maybe a tad easier on you. And when I say easier on you, I just mean easier for the purposes of discussion in this class. Is I'm saying that I have a 12 by 7 8 inch plate lapped onto another 12, 8, 12 by 7 8 inch plate. So it's literally the same plate lapped on top of one another. The reason why I did that is because we're only really going to have one case of bolt bearing. Remember how I said there's always you know, the case of bolt bearing transferring the load that way and the case transferring the load that way, okay? Um, well, they're the same plate. So I'm being, I mean, uh, you know, technically you need to check both, but for the purposes of what we do here in this class, we're only going to check one because they're the same. Sound good? Okay. Now. Let's design this out. Now, before we get in, well, let's let's talk about design. Okay, what was we were given? We were given dead load and live load, right? Probably ought to factor that out. So let's let's factor those loads. Okay, so let's start off with the factored load. So we have a dead load. Dead load of 115 kips and a live load of 160 kips. So a factored load is 1.2 times our dead load plus 1.6 times our live load. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to erase this. <clears throat> All right. 
Um, now, what do we know about these plates? I'll go ahead and, and, and look at one thing. We were told with these plates that these are A572 grade 50 plates. Now, we know the thickness is 7 eighths. Um, we know the width is 12 inches. Um, now, when we're doing a bolt bearing check, do we need FY and FU? What do we need? We just need the FU value because here's our bolt bearing check and FY doesn't, doesn't come into the uh, play. I mean, you can write them both down if you want. And I mean, that's not a bad practice to do that. But what is FU going to be? 65 KSI. 65 KSI. And you got that from where? Uh, table 2-4. Exactly right. And so that's something you should have tabbed if you don't already. Um, if you're looking at a plate that's 8572 grade 50, the FU value is 65 KSI. Okay. Alright. Now, in design, the first thing that you do is you look at bolt shear. Alright, so what do we know? What, what's the deal with these bolts? Are they, uh, what's the diameter? I don't remember. I'm asking you. Three-fourths of an inch. Three-quarters? Okay, are they group A, group B? Yes. Now, help me out. Single shear, double shear? Single shear. They were single shear, right? Let's go back to the problem. So I just have a plate left on top of another plate. So that's a single shear, or that's a bolt under single shear, right? If I had another plate under here, you know, like, like we did on the last problem, that would be a double shear connection. This is just single shear. So single shear. So help me out. What is the capacity per bolt? Anybody got a value for me? 25. Wait, 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 hold on. Uh-oh. Now, which is, now, which is, I'm just messing. Which is it? So, 27.8. Does everybody else have that? That's from table 7-1. So, group BX bolt, single shear, three-quarter inches in diameter. This is 27. 0.8 kit per bolt. All right, and so I got that from table 7-1. Was everybody else able to find that? So, how much load does the connection have on it? Was it 394 kips? And how much can each bolt hold up? 27.8 kips. So therefore, the number of bolts is PU over VRN. In other words, 394 kips on the entire connection. 27.8 kips per bolt. So... How much that, what does that come out to be? 14.17. 14.17 volts. So that's how many volts we use, right? We use 14.17 volts, right? How many volts would we really use? 15 volts. All right? Now, so therefore we're going to use... 15 bolts. Now, I want to ask you a question. Let's say, for the sake of discussion, what do we get? 14.17? Can I ask you a question? 
What if that was our answer? What would you do? I'm asking. 17 volts. Can I show you maybe a potential problem with that? How many are we using here? 15? So, what do we have? Maybe like... Nice little grid of 3 by 5 Something like that, right? What if it was 17? See the problem? 17 is a prime number, right? And so there's no even multiple. Maybe you'd have to do like 15 and I don't know, 16, 17, you know what I mean? But I guess just, just keep that in mind that if there's a way you can sort of arrange it in a, in a pattern that's kind of contained, you know, that's just something to keep in mind. And so honestly, most fabricators, if you did something like that, like if you had like one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. I I would bet somebody's probably gonna put a bolt there just because, you know. Or they're probably gonna ask you why didn't you put a bolt there? You, you know what I mean? So something to think about. What's the likelihood that it's staggered? That's a great question, and we're going to talk about stagger here in a second, that um, staggering can not only improve your net section fracture capacity, but it might give you some means to improve your bolt bearing capacity. I, whenever you're designing a connection, I would never start out with a staggered connection. I would start out with a just grid, and if it doesn't work, that's an option, So, and, I, and I'll show you why here in a second. What are the chances of like... Said 17, but they'll probably use 18. What are the odds like they just go to 20? Like, would that ever happen? Or is that overkill? That's a bit overkill. Yeah, but keep in mind we haven't gotten here yet, too. The slip connections. Now, <clears throat> I've got a connection with 15 volts, but that's all I have. I have no idea how to lay this out. So, Let's look at laying it out. Let's look at layout requirements. Now I'm asking you, I really don't care. We'll, we'll let you have some fun with it. Do you want to use S-min or S-preferred? I don't care. I don't care. It doesn't matter. You want to use S-preferred? He, he prefers to use S preferred, so we're going to use S preferred. So that's three times the bolt diameter, so three times three quarters of an inch, so nine quarters or 2.25 inches. Now, for the edge distance, we don't have a preferred edge distance, we just have a minimum or a maximum. So, what would you use? If you're trying to contain your connection. Minimum, exactly. So use a minimum bolt spacing, or minimum edge distance, sorry. And what is the minimum edge distance going to be? I don't know. That's a look up, isn't it? You have to look up the minimum edge distance. You don't compute that. One inch. Do I have a second on that value? Okay, and so that's from table J3.4. So, what do we have? We have 15 volts. Remind me, how wide is the plate? What is this dimension? Seven inches. No, the wide, the width, sorry. It's 12 inches wide, 7 8 inches thick, right? So 
I'm going to propose if we've got what, 15 bolts? Maybe we do. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Right? What is it? so? So yeah, that would give me what would this distance be? That would be three inches, right? That would meet our bulk spacing requirements, right? Whereas if I did five by three, it'd probably get kind of cramped, right? It might not work. So therefore, here is my proposed connection layout. Okay, so this dimension here so that's my one inch that's two and a quarter two and a quarter two and a quarter two and a quarter and then why you put dimensions on there when you can't draw accurately without a straight edge. And there's my design. Now, in the interest of time, we're technically not done with this problem, but we're going to be done for our purposes today in class. But we'll, we'll get to that in a second. I'll give you all a chance to draw this out. Does everybody have this? Everybody got this? Okay. So what I'm going to say is continued, and I'm going to say remaining tasks. Okay. Do I have to go back and verify that this section has enough bolt shear capacity? I'd say no. I determined that I needed 14.17 volts and I'm using 15. So I know it's got enough bolt shear capacity. I don't need to do that. But I do need to verify that it has bolt bearing capacity. Now, remember, bolt bearing capacity, a couple things. Number one, it always has two cases, but in this problem, those cases are the same, right? Those cases are the same because the plate transfer and load that way and the plate transfer and load that way are the exact same. So I only need to check one of them, okay? And in order to do that, I need a couple quantities. I need an S value which is going to be 2.25, right? That's the spacing, you know, along the load, right? So I'm going to use the 2.25, not the 3 inches, right? I've got an edge distance of 1 inch. I need a thickness of 7 eighths. I need an FU of 65 KSI and a bolt diameter of three quarters of an inch. Now, why am I writing down those values? Because look, here's our expression for bolt bearing, right? What do you need? You need a thickness, you need FU, you need a bolt diameter, and then you need the LC values. And to compute LC, you need the whole diameter, you need S, and you need LE. So once you have those values, you can just plug and chug it. The only other thing you need to know is how many edge bolts you have and how many 
interior bolts. Now help me out. For this connection, how many edge bolts and how many interior bolts do we have? How many edge bolts? Three. How many interior bolts? Twelve, right? So compute the capacity of an edge bolt, compute the capacity of an interior bolt, and there you go. So do I need to go through that? I mean, it's literally the exact same calc as we did on the last problem. It's just different seed values. And remember, we're comparing that against a PU of what, what was that, 394? What was that? Was it 394? Yes. Yeah. Now, let's say that we don't have enough bolt bearing capacity. Let's say we do this and the bolt bearing capacity is 384 or 374. What is a way that we could fix the connection? Well, a simple way of fixing a connection would be to add more bolts, right? That's an easy way of fixing it, but maybe that's a bit overkill. What's another way of fixing it? Well, maybe instead of two and a quarter bolt spacing, we use two and a half. That would increase the amount of space between the bolts and ultimately increase your LC distance, which would increase your bolt bearing. What's a third way of fixing it? Stagger. Stagger the connection. Because a staggered connection, while not drastically improving the connection, and bless you, instead of having, you know, like a grid spacing, if we staggered this row, We still have three edge bolts and 12 interior bolts, but this bolt has a different edge distance than that one. I'm not going to make you do that on homework or an exam, but that is one way that you could uh, arrest this, is to stagger your connection, give you a little bit of increased edge distance here. That's, that's another way. Really what I would do is if you're in design mode and you end up getting a bearing capacity less than that, I'd up your bolt spacing by a quarter of an inch or something like that. That's probably going to be more than enough. More quarter inch, half inch, something like that. Sound good? All right. <laughs> Keep in mind there's also gross section yieldings. Maybe I should write that. I should say gross section yielding, net section fracture, block shear, rupture. God, that's, that's like slenderness. All the other stuff associated with um, uh, the connection. Am I okay with skipping all this or do you want me to rock through it? I can't go on. <coughs> okay. So there's your layout, assuming it meets that it has a bolt bearing capacity higher than 394. Okay. Now, <coughs> one thing that I, I, I didn't mention uh, that I want to cover right now is uh, I said I have additional bolted connection issues and I want to talk about splices. Okay. When I'm talking about a splice, what I'm talking about is sort of something like this. So. This is much more complex splice than what I'm talking about, but for our discussion purposes, maybe it'll, it'll help out. So this is a bolted field splice for a bridge. Okay? Now this bolted field splice is meant to transfer bending and shear. We're not talking about just yanking on it, but the discussion point that I'm talking about is kind of the same thing. Okay, so in this connection, there's oodles and oodles of different bolts. Okay? But I've got bolts on one side and on another. You can see they're not quite finished because they haven't put in all the bolts uh, over here. But that's sort of besides uh, our point. What I want to do is I want to take this real life example and sort of whittle it down to this. Okay. So in this connection, I have a total of eight bolts. Okay. But they're not all working in the same direction. Okay. Whenever you have a splice connection, what you've got is you've got member A, which is by itself in space, and member B, which is by itself in space, 
and you're lapping a plate sort of on top and on bottom to join these members together. Okay? As a result, half of these bolts are working to transfer load this way, and the other half are working to transfer load this way. Now, one thing I think we can all agree on is that every one of these bolts, for instance, in this case, is in double shear, right? If I've got a double shear connection, let's say they're all uh, they're one inch diameter, eight, uh, 8490N, so group B in bolts, right? But half of them are transferring load this way and half of them are transferring load this way. So let's take the bolt shear capacity, right? I look up the capacity of a one inch diameter, a group B threads included bolt in double shear, and I get a number. If I want the bolt shear capacity of the entire connection, do I multiply by eight bolts? The answer is no, because half the bolts are transferring load in one direction, half the bolts are transferring the load in the other. So instead of, if I'm trying to determine the bolt shear capacity of this connection, I don't multiply by eight, I multiply by four. Okay? And when I'm looking at bolt bearing, what I do is I samurai sword or lightsaber right through the middle of the section. And I say, okay, I've got one case transferring load this way, one case transferring load this way, but I only look at half the connection. Okay, does that make sense? So you all have this on a homework problem where, let me see. So here's your, your homework assignment, and your first problem. Okay, I'm giving you a W16 by 77 that have, that's being spliced together, so this is a tension member. Okay, now if you look at, so this is on the side, on the side. If you look at one of these plates up top, it looks like there's, what, 16 bolts? But you would only consider eight of them, right? And so, for instance, if I'm looking at this plate, Two of these are edge bolts, six of them are interior bolts. Whether you look at this side or this side is irrelevant. Two edge bolts, six are interior. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay, all right. Okay. Well, we don't have a lot of time, so maybe I will kind of talk a little bit about slip critical connections. Um, just to just to illustrate the situation, how many of you have ever done any sort of work in I don't know, your parents' garage, worked on a lawnmower, worked on a car, worked on? I, I assume m most engineers have tinkered with stuff in their lives at some point or another. Sort of natural to to, to our profession. Imagine that I have a machine. Oh, let's take, let's say it's a weed whacker or a lawnmower or something like that. And I have a bolt on that machine that's tightening something together. And I turn on, let's say it's a lawnmower. I turn on, but the bolt isn't very tight. What's going to happen after a while? Vibrate loose. It's going to vibrate loose, right? So you kind of have to wrench that thing, right? Now, what happens when I say wrench that thing? Okay, so I've got a plate, a plate. I stick a bolt through them, and I tighten the hell out of it. What happens to the plates? They sandwich together, right? The tighter I wrench on that thing, the more those plates are going to want to push together, right? So would you say that between those two plates, there's a normal force being developed? Remember this whole thing in physics where if you have a normal force, and those two planes have a coefficient of static friction that you get a frictional force developed between them, right? It's kind of like when you're moving the fridge across the kitchen. The way that you figure out how much force you need to push is a function of the weight of the fridge and then the coefficient of static friction between the fridge and the floor, right? Okay. Well, that's exactly what's happening in a slip critical connection. You're you're wrenching those bolts together to the point that those plates are pushing on one another, right? You can actually count on that in a scenario. Now, the equivalent to the lawnmower, it's not, we're not building lawnmowers in, in, in civil engineering land, but we are building bridges, right? 
And bridges are loaded, unloaded, loaded, unloaded, loaded, unloaded, loaded, unloaded, and they see cyclic loading, and they undergo millions of cycles of loading throughout their design life. So maybe what we need is a connection that is going to stay put. That's a slip critical connection. Slip critical connection is when you actually count on that friction. And what it's a function of, and this is the expression, and we'll talk about this next time, but it's a function of the coefficient of static friction and the normal force. So this T sub B is the normal force, the bolt pretension. This is your coefficient of static friction. The rest are some just factors that, that we'll talk about later. Um, like, for instance, this N sub S is the number of slip planes. It's basically just the number of shear planes. Um, we'll talk about that next time, but it's really, really easy to, uh, to handle. If you can handle bolt shear, you can handle this. It's just um, there's a little bit more to it from a, um, from a design standpoint. <coughs> Um, we'll talk about that in detail next time. We'll do a real quick example on it, and then we'll um, uh, then we'll get into combined loads. That's all I got.